Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. This is the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of Canada. Throughout this episode, we will be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they are working to make their community a better place for everyone. Now, today, we are honored to be sitting down and chatting with Councillor Tara Elwood of the Village of Alberta Beach, Alberta. But before we jump into that interview, we would like to say that we couldn't embark on this journey without your support. Creating content that sheds light on the issues affecting municipalities requires both dedication and resources. Now, if you believe in our mission and want to help us to continue to grow, please consider visiting our support page on the Cross Border Interviews website. Every contribution, big or small, goes a long way in ensuring that we can keep delivering the kind of content that you have come to expect from us. Now, on to our interview with Councillor Elwood. Tara, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start off my line of questionings with the age-old question that I've asked every single municipal leader who's ever come on this show. So you are no exception to the first question, and that is, where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from? <laughs> so my sense of duty to serve my community stems from a deep-seated belief in the importance of civic engagement and a desire to contribute to the well-being of the place I call home. Growing up, I witnessed the positive impact that dedicated community leaders can have, and it inspired me to play an active role in making a difference. Was mom and dad political? Uh, not really. My dad was very active in um, First Nations issues. Um, we are First Nation family. So um, I remember my dad at a young age going to Indian Affairs at the time and and fighting the good fight. I, I, I so I've got to ask the sort of uh, sort of million dollar question here, Tara, and is how does uh, someone who doesn't come from a semi political family become not only a councillor, but deputy mayor and mayor of their community. Take me through the progress process of you deciding to finally put your name forward and giving back to your community as you talked about earlier on in your in the opening statement. Uh, so what was it? Eight years ago now, uh, I decided to put my name forward with another young lady at the time that you also know, Miss Angela Duncan. And um, we both ran at the time for transparency uh, within our municipality. Also, we didn't see any involvement from younger families representing young families and families with children. And then also like municipal politics allows for direct engagement with the everyday issues that affect community members. And I chose this level of government because I wanted to be closely connected to the needs and concerns of my neighbors. Why was that important for you? Why was it important for you to stay connected? Because um, I can imagine um, there are probably many different venues you could have chosen to get involved in, whether it be nonprofit, whether it be uh, volunteerism. But you said the best way to stay connected was putting my name on that ballot with uh, the former mayor of uh, Alberta Beach, uh, Angela Duncan. So what was it about the connection that kept you involved and deciding to put your name on the ballot in 20 and i'm gonna get this wrong here probably 2013 uh yeah i think you're right about 2013 <laughs> um it was just i i wanted to be involved in a decision making process uh i i saw a lot of inactivity um with people wanting to put their name forward it had been the same the same people over and over and over again and i didn't see any oh gosh how do i say this without being mean uh when i didn't see any substantive change especially geared towards younger families so putting my name forward with that brought that forward and allowed a different perspective so with that in mind, now you've been on council for some time now, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, and correct me if I'm wrong here, because I'm going off the Alberta government's information. Um, you were elected in 2013, if I'm not mistaken, defeated in 2017, and then re-elected in 2021? 
Correct. I okay. lost by nine votes. Nine votes. Okay. <laughs> that Those nine votes. And you'll always remember those nine votes. Those nine votes. Yeah. So I want to ask the sort of million dollar question to follow up that decision making about bringing that voice for young families. Do you think you've accomplished that? It, looking back on your time in office, do you think you've given a voice to the young families in the village of Alberta Beach? I think I've op- I, I've offered that bridge um, between between myself and younger families. Uh, they see someone that has young I well, had young kids; they're all grown up now. Um, what and kids don't stay the same relate. age? Kids don't <laughs> say young all the time. <laughs> oh, you know. Actually, no, I like it this way. I, I actually have a little bit more money in my pocket. <laughs> uh, the, the honesty, I love it. Um, so you 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 saw you're bridging that gap. How did you do that? How did you see your role as counselor, as an elected official in bridging that gap? Was it just putting a different perspective on the lens that you were looking at each issue that was presented in front of council? Or what was the process that you chose, you took to make those that decision making uh, process easier to make sure that young families did see sort of a voice and a vote on council? Well, I think it was, they saw me everywhere. They saw me coaching Little League for baseball. Uh, They saw me at the schools. They saw me in the bus lineup. Uh, And I offered that difference of opinion. And I'm I'm known for, I have the nickname of being a bit of a spitfire. Um, I'm known for not, for stirring the pot and not being uh, afraid of licking the spoon, for lack of a better term. So I, I'm, I'm there to get in your face and get things done. Uh, Angela and I, uh, we got the new playground installed on the main beach. And that was something that needed to be done here. Um, but it was, like I said, it was a lot of the same old, same old. Now, over the your term in office, I'm 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 going to assume, and I should never assume on my show, but I like to assume that you have had to make some very tough decisions. And I say that knowing that when it comes to budgeting, when it comes to issues around service levels, you are the ultimate decider. You are you and your council have to sit around and make the decisions that are best for the community. And that means sometimes you're not going to please 100 percent of the people, as I can imagine you have found out in your time in municipal politics. When you go into that council chambers, you have to be prepared for every single thing that is presented in front of you. How do you see your role as being prepared for the issues that are in front of you with the agenda packages that come out the day before or the few days before, but not concrete in your decisions because you have to be open to potentially change it because of something that may come up at council or someone who gives a presentation at council may give you a sway and say, I didn't think of it that way, and I'm glad you brought it forward. How do you see your role as counselor in making those tough decisions, but not being so concrete in your decision prior to that vote? I take attending our council meetings prepared very seriously, as being informed is crucial to effective decision making. Adaptability is equally important. Local leaders must be responsive to the dynamic nature of community issues and be willing to adjust their perspective based on new information and public input. What does that mean, though? Because I can imagine, uh, oh, I shouldn't, actually, I'm going to rephrase this question because I think it's an important question I need to ask to follow up to that. I have spoken to many different municipal leaders from across Canada, particularly here in Alberta, but from across Canada. And the one thing I often hear is there's an apathy within our municipal structure. When you go out and talk to people, are they willing to give their opinions on certain issues that are in front of your council? When you have to make your tough decisions, you have to gauge from people who voted for you, people who did not vote for you, and you have to come to a conclusion yourself. When you ask for people's input, are they willing to give it to you in the a village? 
Yes, um, most most people here are willing to give their uh, their straightforward <laughs> opinion. <laughs> Sometimes not very nicely, but yes, absolutely. And I I think part of our decision making here is not not necessarily what's going to affect us today or tomorrow, but what may affect our municipality ten years down the road as well. So is that hard? I enjoy. It, it 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 is it is hard to balance that because you don't know what may be coming down the road. We don't know if what's coming down from the provincial side. Um, we don't know what's coming down municipal uh, elected side in in the future. But we got to try and make that balance on what what is best for the community as a whole in the long term. But how do you balance the long term with the short term? Because I, I can imagine if I go talk to 100 people in the village today, I can guarantee you they're going to tell me 100 <laughs> different issues that are yes. facing your community. But you as a counselor have to look at the community as a whole and move it forward. But you can't forget about the here and now. And the here and now is the most important part for the people who are living in your community. So how do you balance, how do you see your role as balancing the needs of right here, right now versus the long-term viability, viability of your community? Well, it's, it's difficult. It depends on what, what it is right now. Um, everybody within Alberta is kind of struggling with um, crime in the area. Uh, so it's, I sit on the, the, uh, community police advisory committee um, with with Parkland, and we discuss these issues. And we we ask our our boys in blue what they're doing to mitigate these issues. We've we've made uh, decisions here at my level to to contract with the RCMP for um, kind of enhanced policing, but we've given them. A set of hours that we would like them to fill and not necessarily only on weekends or during the day i want them to come out where when when crime is more likely to happen to make the presence so that's one way we've we've dealt with current issues and we're going to talk about a few issues later on in the interview, but I want to stick on you for a few minutes because I like to get to know the person behind the persona of a counselor. And I have got to sort of uh, uh, poke the bear a little bit and say, you are a, I, and I, I say this respectfully, you are a part-time yeah. counselor, but you work full-time mm -hmm. hours because That's very the, sure. <laughs> the job of a counselor does not end after the council meeting and does not start in the, at the beginning of the council meeting. You have to read, you have to be prepared, you have to engage, you have to go to communities, you go to Alberta Municipalities Conferences, you sit on Alberta Municipalities Board, um, and also you are the counselor, no matter where you go in your community. So the moment you step foot out of your door, people will possibly come up to talk to you and ask you questions about what's going on in the community. How do you balance that part of the job? How do you balance the personal life of being Tara with being counselor Elwood? Uh, it's a blurred line, to be honest with you. <laughs> does it get Does it get easier though? It does. Um, I mean, my all my neighbors know who I am and what I do, um, both in my my nine to five job as well as as my municipal role. Uh, and we've we're really good. I I mean, my family my family has ta has taken a backseat for many a year, but uh, my husband he calls himself the Jackie to my Kennedy. And, <laughs> So we we we've adapted over the years. My family's been very supportive, thankfully. And I've also worked worked for different organizations that have been extremely flexible, allowing me to continue in my municipal role. So I, I, I'm just going to take a jump here and say that your husband and your kids are probably not going to the grocery store with you when you have to go get a bag of milk because mom <laughs> could be there for 20 minutes to an hour talking about the latest budget or the latest big issue in the community, are they? Yeah, very much so. Uh, we've, we've gone uh, 
into West Hampton Mall and and they both kind of go oh, again. Uh, we'll be over here, and I'm like, I'll find you in a bit. <laughs> um, I I want to turn to segment two here for a second, and uh, okay. before I before I ask this question, I preface it all the time because I want to make sure I draw a clear line between the person I'm talking to and the role that you have. This is a conversation between the counselor and myself. This is not a motion of counsel. This is not a direction of counsel. This is not even a policy of counsel. The counselor <laughs> is one vote on her counsel out of five. So I have to ask the million dollar question, not the million dollar question, because that's going to come a little bit later. But the question to start off this segment is, in your opinion, what do you see as the biggest issue or issues facing the village of Alberta Beach today as of recording this episode? Well, I'm I'm very glad that you've you've pointed <laughs> that out that this is my view as a personal perspective rather than an official council stance. Um a pro a prominent concern within our community is the state of our lake achieving a harmonious balance between responsible lake usage and safeguarding the diverse ecosystem ecosystems it houses <laughs> poses a considerable challenge. Um, additionally, securing provincial funding for essential infrastructure projects is another pressing issue demanding our community's concerted efforts. Addressing these matters both requires collaborative and strategic approaches to develop sustainable solutions. So to follow up, mm -hmm. I can imagine that this is not something that is just spawned up overnight. This has probably been an ongoing issue, probably even dating back to when you first were elected in 2013. You and I both know that the province runs at a different pace than municipalities. Municipalities are here and right now, and the decisions you make affect people the next day. The province, can, and this is Chris saying this, this is not the councillor saying this, the problems can take two, three, four months to make a decision. But you know that you have to sort of figure out a solution to protecting the lake and its ecosystem right here, right now. So what do you see as your role and the role of council in doing to protect the state of the lake to make sure it doesn't deteriorate until the province and uh, in, in some sense the federal government comes to the table because when we talk about environmental issues the federal government does have a say to come yeah. to the table and address these issues as a trilateral issue instead of just a unilateral municipal issue so we we do have a few different uh groups in our area so we have lilsa and <coughs> oh excuse me we also have uh, the North Saskatchewan Watershed Alliance, as well as I've attended a few seminars with our neighboring First Nation Alexis. Um, we're all collectively working for what's best for our lake. Um, not necessarily right here, right now. Um, we know it's an ongoing process. We're trying to find the roots of the problems and how we can address it in the long term. Uh, we're looking at lake health, we're doing water samples, we're checking lake levels, uh, the tributaries that run in, and and if there's any contaminants. So far, our lake is extremely healthy, and we're trying to keep it that way. Is there buy-in from the residents of the village as well? Because we often forget about that aspect of the working towards uh, the state of something the residents have to buy in because it's technically their tax dollars it's their money that is going to protect it so when you're talking about these issues that were particularly around the lake are residents saying yes we need to protect it because it is a driver for our community yes uh we have quite a few um We've had quite a few educational sessions over the time, over the years. Um, we've put out uh, information blasts on uh, lake living. So what you should or shouldn't do to your lawn. We have a lot of people who would like to have the beautiful lush green lawn, but we're trying to give them other options or inform them of other options on how to achieve that without using harsh chemicals, which get then get leached into our lake. 
same with the way the municipality runs things we we don't do salts on our roads because it, it eventually it runs off and goes into the lake uh, when we do road clearing we're cognizant of where where the piles go uh, what what contaminants may be in those and we're we're always always looking we're actually working on an inf information session right now hopefully uh, Environment Canada comes to the table so we can have a big community open house on lake stewardship and lake health. I was going to ask this earlier on, but we've talked about three different levels of government here. And I want to sort of pose this question to you because I think it's important, particularly in the context around what's going on with the lake and the state of the lake and the, you know, protecting the ecosystem. I have spoken, as I've said, with many municipal leaders from across Canada, and I hear the same thing over and over again that the average resident does not truly understand the jurisdictional roles and responsibilities that each level of government plays. When they come talk to you as you're their municipal counselor, they may ask you a lot of questions about things that you just have no purview in, whether it be healthcare, education, passports, you name it, they're gonna come talk to you about this because you are the closest to the people. Do you get a sense in Alberta Beach that there the people of your community understand the jurisdictional roles? And if not, how do you see your role as counselor in bridging that gap to ensure that people understand that healthcare, while it is important to municipalities, that is a provincial issue. <laughs> and you need to go talk to your MLA about that issue or health or education may want to go talk to your school board trustee and then go talk to your MLA. Do you get a sense that people understand the jurisdictional roles in Alberta beach? Um, yeah, like there, there can be instances where the roles of different levels of government overlap, of course, uh, leading to a bit of potential blurring of jurisdictions. However, it's essential to educate residents on these distinctions when residents approach me with concerns, I find there's often some confusion. Part of my role is to help clarify these distinctions and guide them to the appropriate levels of government to address their specific issues. Do you find that they're doing it because they wanna be heard or they actually have an issue that they need to be solved? I think it's a little bit of both. Um, everybody wants to be heard. Um, I think that's very important. Uh, that when you have an issue, you you want you want someone to listen to what you're saying, so they can either empathize with you or offer some sort of assistance. And I think that's that's part of it, where where people do approach you and say, you know, I have issues with this, this, and this. You listen, and then you point them in the right direction. I've been accused on this show of only talking about the bad things in this segment, only talking about the issues that municipalities face. And I'm saying that because I know the counselor will be listening who accused me of this. So I have to ask the follow the sort of flip question that I originally started segment two off, which is while there are probably issues that we could talk about for some time, what does Alberta Beach do right? What is the thing that you boast about when you go to conferences, whether it be Alberta municipalities, whether it's talking to other municipal leaders from across Alberta or even Canada, what is the thing that you say to them? You might be doing it good. We're doing it better. What's the one thing that Alberta Beach is boasting about and you particularly are boasting about? Oh, goodness. Where do I start? <laughs> Gee whiz. We're, we're just we're a natural gem here uh, and our our community has such rich history uh alberta beach was started as a, a railroad town so it was started by cn rail who saw this because they were coming here to get water and actually buy fish from one of my descendants or ancestors and and they decided hey this is a great place for us to come in the summer for our staff and then it, it went from there, but we have, it's such a gorgeous area to live. Not to mention we have, we have a, 
a, a small economy here. We do have grocery stores. We have excellent restaurants. Our hospitality here is second to none. So you've mentioned something I like to talk about. So I want to play in that play playground for a little bit here for a second. And I, I want to talk about tourism because okay. I think tourism is a unsung economic driver that a lot of municipalities don't often talk about, but it's there because people will come to their communities, but municipalities just don't, in my opinion, this is my opinion and not the councillor's opinion. I think uh, tourism is a factor that more municipalities should be talking about. And as I've said on the show, if you come on my show, I will come to your community and spend my economic dollars in your community. So be prepared to see me in 2024 in Alberta beach. Hopefully we can grab a coffee. Absolutely. What- What are some of the hidden gems? What are some of the tourist destinations? And you don't have to just stick within Alberta Beach because I understand that tourism is not just a one singular module. It is a expanding and it could go into the surrounding communities. What are some of the hidden gems in your area that people of Alberta or Canada who are listening to this across Canada need to come to see in Alberta Beach? Oh. So our community boasts several hidden gems for tourists, um, such as our heritage village or our local restaurants. These spots not only showcase the natural beauty and hospitality of our area, but also highlight the rich culture and historical aspects that make our community unique. We also have a wonderful boat launch that people use. It's not, we don't charge to use it. Um, and you can spend the entire day, the entire weekend here. We have a beautiful municipal campground here that you can bring your RV in and spend the weekend, the week, the long weekend, the month, the season even. Where do you go? Where do you go in the community to just let it all escape? Because I can imagine in your time in office, you've probably had to make some very tough decisions and there are days where you are just done and you need to just decompress and just let it go because you know tomorrow morning you're going to be back at it, whether it be doing your regular job, being a mom, being a partner to your husband, being a counselor, heck for you, being a counselor, deputy mayor, mayor from time to time as well. Where in your community do you go to let it all just go away? All right. So to relax and decompress, um, <laughs> I often find solace in in doing some smudging to clear my mind or I wander up to the beach to stand in awe of our, mus- our absolutely stunning sunsets. I pick medicine or I go grab my dad and we throw a line in the water and we compete on who can catch the most fish. <laughs> uh, these, can I, these can I moments, ask who it is? Who, who, who's better usually at catching fish? Usually my dad's really good, but I am up by two. <laughs> oh, he is going to hear this and he's going to be out on the lake tomorrow going, okay, if she's up by two, I'm going to be up by four by the end of the week. Well, we go together. So, it, so it's an honest competition. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, I I have to ask the last question, and it's kind of an important question because I truly believe every municipal leader from large communities to small villages or even summer villages know how to properly answer this question, but we can always have it on the record for 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years from now. So in your opinion, what makes the village of Alberta Beach such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? Well, Alberta Beach, there's so much to say, but I'll try and compress it. Our community's uniqueness lies in its natural beauty, of course. Our amazing community groups, access to the lake and recreational activities, as well as its proximity to the city or other amenities. These factors create an environment where residents can not only live comfortably, but also find meaningful employment and build stronger a stronger foundation for their families. It's this combination of factors that makes our community an exceptional place to call home. That is beautiful. That is um, um, Tara, 
thank you so much. Uh, I, I, I always learn so much from these interviews and I, I get so much pleasure of sitting down with a local elected leaders from across Canada and learning about their communities from them and really the reason why people get involved municipally. I, I, I want to thank you for serving your community. I don't think municipal leaders hear that enough. I think it's high time that they do hear that. I think you are the most important level of government out there, and I think you do not get the recognition that you properly deserve. So A, thank you so much for serving. Thank you so much for making your community a better place. Thank you so much for being an ambassador for your community. But for me, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to sit down, talk about Alberta Beach, and just educate me and my listeners about your role, your responsibility, and the village of Alberta Beach. So thank you so much. Well, thank you so much, Chris, for having me. Thank you for joining us for another great episode of the Cross Border Interviews. Your continued interest in delving deep into the issues that shape our communities across Canada is both inspiring and essential to our mission. Now, as we wrap up, it is my hope that you have gained valuable insights into the intricate world of municipal politics from our guest today. Now, if you found this dialogue as engaging as I did, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. By subscribing, you're not just staying up to date with our latest conversations, but you're playing a vital role in supporting our endeavor to bring you more meaningful content. Now, we couldn't embark on this journey without your support. Creating content that sheds light on the issues affecting municipalities requires dedication and resources. Now, if you believe in our mission and want to help us to continue to grow, please visit our support page conveniently linked in the show notes or by visiting crossborderinterviews.ca. Every contribution, big or small, goes a long way in ensuring that we can keep delivering the kind of content that you have come to expect from us. Once again, thank you for being part of the Cross Border Interviews community. Your engagement is what fuels our passion for shedding light on the issues that truly matter in Canada. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.